do what needs to be done. I'm going to Miami. The Minnesota Vikings entered the NFL in 1961 and quickly solidified themselves as a powerhouse in the 1970s after winning the 1969 NFL Championship game. Free safety, Paul Krause intercepted to end Cleveland's biggest threat of the day. The team's fan base exploded under head coach Bud Grant and a defensive line led by Alan Page that called themselves Purple People Eaters. With pursuit worthy of a linebacker. This combination of strength and speed made Page an all-pro in his third season. After a loss to the Chiefs in Super Bowl IV, the Vikings appeared in three Super Bowls in four years as Fran Tarkenton returned from the Giants after having previously been drafted by the Vikings in the 1961 draft. However, losses in Super Bowl VIII, IX, and XI would leave the Vikings looking for redemption in the coming seasons. They would appear in just two more conference championships over the next 20 years, in 1977 and 1987. And it all comes down to one last play. It's fourth down, down there by the goal line, and Wade Wilson sends his running back out of the backfield, Darren Nelson. He works his way to the goal line, and suddenly he's got a shot for the catch that might deny you a Super Bowl. But it is not to be, because fate today was on the side of the Washington Redskins, who have won the NFC Championship and now head to San Diego. As you can imagine, I was born a Vikings fan, raised a Vikings fan. Um, it's been a pleasure. And it's been painful. But mostly a pleasure. Fans never gave up on the Vikings, even as they settled into a seemingly cursed run over the course of the early 1990s. Four wildcard appearances in five seasons between 1992 and 1996 brought to question if the Vikings would ever have the necessary leadership to bring them through the postseason. fan since I was five years old, fell in love with Fran Targenton and the Purple People Eaters, and here I am at 47, still a diehard fan. My story about being a lifelong Vikings fan involves my son when he was four months old. I was changing his diaper during the Vikings game, so I have his diaper off, I've cleaned up the boy and the mess, and all of a sudden I hear a roar from the crowd on the television. So as the big Vikings fan I am, I grab my son Cooper this being Cooper, I run out to the television to see what just happened. I think it was a Vikings touchdown. I can't remember the play, but it was something good for the Vikings. And I'm holding my son Cooper like this, looking at the replay, and all of a sudden I just feel heat all over my front of my shirt, and I turn and look, and my son is urinating all over my Vikings shirt. Not this one, but one just like it. And he completely coated me in his own urine. And if that doesn't describe what it's like to be a Viking fan, then I don't know what does. You guys just got the worst call of the damn year. The guy was hit, he went down. He didn't trip on his own. Is that right? Hell yeah! By 1997, Dennis Green was assembling a promising team. Running back Robert Smith was coming into his prime, and the team had also acquired receiver Chris Carter, who was getting back into a groove while John Randall crushed opposing quarterbacks on defense. Oh, let's go, baby! Let's go! Regulators, mount up! There are other players during this time period that, that, that do stick out to me, like Jack Del Rio, uh, Randall McDaniel, but John Randall just to me embodied Vikings defense at that point point right the dude was like a beast he was like a rabid dog when he was on that field like a little dude who would just he would he would get quarterbacks with his speed and face paint right and that dude was always ready to play and he was so fun to watch before the season green had made a call to randall cunningham the former eagles quarterback who'd left the league at the end of the 1995 season and started a granite business green would convince cunningham to agree to return to the nfl and back up quarterback Brad Johnson. Randall Cunningham getting pressure. Oh, he's got him downfield. That's six and six. Chris Carter wide open, and Carter will score for Minnesota. 
An injury to Johnson in December would put Cunningham back in action as he would limp the Vikings into a wildcard appearance at 9-7 and, and defeat the Giants in a close game to advance to the divisional round. While here the Vikings would fall to the 49ers, the season showed promise. Wide receiver from Marshall University, Randy Moss. The team continued to expand its offensive attack by drafting explosive wide receiver Randy Moss with the 21st overall pick. Randall hangs in, throws, and it is caught. Reed spinning around and avoiding the tackle and staying in bounds to score. 1998 would begin with four straight wins to start the season before facing off on Monday Night Football against border rival Green Bay, who was also undefeated. There, the Vikings would fire on all cylinders, proving how threatening they were going to be in 98. And it's Mark looking to throw. The Vikings defense intercepted Brett Favre three times, leading to his benching. On the flip side, Cunningham threw four touchdown passes, two to Randy Moss. Randall going deep again, adjusting his Moss, and then Randy Moss squeezes his way in for the touchdown. It is unbelievable. He just throws it up, and these guys catch. After Tampa Bay handed them their first loss in Week 9, the Vikings were right back on a three-game win streak when they faced the Cowboys on Thanksgiving. And he is throwing it back to Cunningham, the old flea picker, and open is Randy Moss, and in the end zone is a Minnesota touchdown. Cunningham once again tossed four touchdown passes, three to Moss, and together Moss and Carter combined for nearly 300 yards. And Carter hits for the end zone and scores, no flags this time. The touchdown pass from Cunningham to Carter. Randy Moss, the super freak. I mean, that guy, right? He came out of nowhere. It was his rookie season. Uh, of course, people had heard about, you know, problems off the field, problems in college. Uh, he came in and, 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 and changed the game forever uh, with his athleticism. Uh, the guy runs like a cheetah, jumps like a gazelle. Let's be real. Their success would follow them to the playoffs after winning the next four games. After a first round bye, they squared off against Arizona in a divisional round game that was over before it started. The Vikings put up 17 points before the Cardinals even got on the board and didn't look back from there, easily claiming a 41-21 victory. Denny Green, what a job he's done. Bring on the dirty birds. Hey, we ought to go on stage. Yeah, and it's going to be right. It's going to be the NFL on Fox and... We'll be here next week, and can't wait for that one. The Vikings sat just one win away from returning to the Super Bowl for the first time since the 1976 season. Standing in their way was the Atlanta Falcons, a team poised on stopping them. Third and ten, Cunningham drops. Moss goes deep. Cunningham lost the ball somehow. Pump fake, and he lost it. The game quickly turned into one of the greatest shootouts in NFL history. The Vikings led it at half and went into the locker room with a 20-14 lead after giving up a late touchdown to Chris Chandler. Attempt to field goal. The Falcons, however, refused to lie down. They claimed three points early, but Cunningham led the Vikings back, giving them a 10-point lead early in the fourth. Touchdown, Matthew Hatchett. When Falcons kicker Morton Anderson shed the Vikings' lead to just seven points, Dennis Green was determined to pull his team away again. Cunningham led the electrifying offense down into enemy territory as time rolled off the clock. The Falcons defense made the stop, and with just over two minutes remaining in the game, Vikings kicker Gary Anderson came on to attempt a pivotal field goal. Having never missed a field goal all year, Vikings fans were counting on Anderson to give them a 10-point, two-possession lead and take away any hope the Falcons had left. And Anderson hasn't missed in two years. I just remember the kick. That's like the only real thing I remember. So we'll make this field goal. The answer should probably be yes. 39 yards away. And it's not good. The Falcons have one timeout. They have the ball as Anderson misses. Pulled it left. Gary Anderson's miss gave the Falcons a chance and put the pressure on the Vikings defense to retain the lead and bring them to the Super Bowl. 
But, just as they had before halftime, Chandler connected with Terrence Mathis for a game-tying touchdown. Oh, holy hey brother! Do you go for two? <laughs> no, heck no, you don't go for two. You gotta tie it up. The first thing you have to do is you have to get tied, then you go for a win. The Vikings came into overtime swinging. They started with the ball, and Cunningham looked deep to Moss, but the pass fell incomplete. After receiving the ball on the following punt, Chandler led his team downfield into field goal range. Morton Anderson then made a 38-yard field goal to end the game, put the final nail in the Vikings' Super Bowl hopes. Morton Anderson. From 38 yards officially, Morton Anderson and the Atlanta Falcons ended 30-27, to and Atlanta goes to Miami. 1999, however, looked not only like a chance for the Vikings to expand off of last year's success, but also provide an opportunity to plan for the future. The Vikings traded Brad Johnson away to the Redskins in exchange for a variety of picks, including the 11th overall, which they used to draft quarterback Dante Culpepper out of Central Florida. There's Leroy Horde who's back in the game right now, and Randall Cunningham goes down. The season, however, went far from expected. By the time Cunningham visited the Silver Dome to face Detroit, the Vikings were 2-3. and three. Granted, every game so far that season had came down to a difference of 7 or less points, the coaching staff and fans were still not impressed. And the Lions get it inside the 15. Trailing Detroit 19-0 going into the second half, Coach Green benched Cunningham in favor of backup Jeff George. The team rallied around George as he put up two touchdowns in less than six minutes in the third quarter. The Vikings failed to close the deal, however, as Jason Hansen hit a 48-yard field goal with seven seconds remaining to give the Lions the win. George led the team through the remaining 10 games, going 8-2 and two and closing out the season 10-6, and six, giving way to a wild-card matchup against the Cowboys. With George putting up three touchdowns to complement Robert Smith's 140 yards on the ground, the Vikings easily defeated Troy Aikman's Cowboys and pulled off a 27-10 win. He's going to have a free run. Yep. Touchdown. Chris Carter. Chris Carter's a gamer and has been for a long time. The divisional round would bring about an unlikely matchup. A washed-up former number one pick of George would face off against a team led by Kurt Warner, who was only one year removed from the Rams' practice squad. Footballs would fly all game as George threw four touchdown passes and Warner topped it with five of his own. But Minnesota would come up short in the high-scoring event, losing 49-37. to The Rams were 8-0 in regular season here, and then playoffs are 1-0, so... The Rams have been perfect in this stadium this year. Four consecutive playoff appearances was nothing to scoff at, but when George hesitated on signing his contract before the 2000 season, the Vikings opted to move on without him. This meant putting into action Culpepper for the first time in his career. The team won their first seven games as Robert Smith put himself on track to break the then Vikings team record for rushing yards. Here's the ball game. Fourth and seven for the Patriots. Have to get to the seven yard line for a first down. Bledsoe fakes. He's being rushed. They've got him. And down he goes. Bryce Pop. And to Lance Sawyer there as well. And like Dante Culpepper, my quarterback could beat up your quarterback because my quarterback is a giant monster with tiny hands. Like he has small hands. The guy's got small hands for a dude that size. Packers show blitz, Culpepper throws, caught, slant, Moss in Green Bay territory, then shovels the ball to Carter, and Carter is out of bounds at the 31-yard line. In Week 10, the Vikings took to Lambeau Field for a Monday night faceoff. With intense pressure riding on young Culpepper, he struggled against the Packers' defense, throwing three interceptions. In the end zone by Darren Sharper, and then Sharper gets up, he could have stayed down, and runs it back out to the 16-yard line. The Vikings entered the fourth quarter with the game tied, and it would stay that way. Ball going out of bounds. He goes down the sidelines, breaks two tackles right there. Leroy Butler, the last one, who's a very solid tackler. Smith made it look easy. That is Robert Smith's first touchdown reception in two years. The play that would transpire in overtime was one for the history books. 
On third and four, from the 43-yard line, Favre launched a pass to Antonio Freeman that would live in infamy. The catch at the 15. Yes. What are they going to roll it? He caught it. Touchdown. <laughs> he did what? Oh. Right on his left, uh, his left you... arm, bring the ball up in the air, and he oh, 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 the field. six oh, inches oh, off the grass. What a catch. Unbelievable awareness of where the ball is we on his body, on and he's got field. himself a touchdown. The Vikings, however, would finish the season with an 11-5 record and easily clean up the Saints in the divisional round to face off against the Giants in the NFC Championship game. And I remember, uh, on the day of the NFC Championship game, I lived in Harlem, right? And I was traveling down to Brooklyn, okay? Which is a long, long train ride, okay? So, uh, for that day... I put on all my Vikings gear, all of it. I had a purple Vikings hat on. I had a purple Vikings hoodie. Under that, I had my purple Vikings T-shirt, right? And I'm, I, I, I'm not zipping up my coat. It's all out, and I'm walking around just waiting for people to talk to me, waiting for people to say things to me, and no one's saying anything. Um, I think it's because they were afraid of the Vikings. But the Giants were a formidable foe, and when they ran away with a 34-point first-half lead, the game seemed all but over by halftime. Kerry Collins tossed five touchdown passes as the Giants shut out the Vikings 41 to nothing in one of the most embarrassing games in franchise history. It also proved to be the final game that Vikings legend John Randall would play in a purple jersey. And so, I went home. From Brooklyn to Harlem, and only this time, and uh, <laughs> it was such a thorough, thorough beating, and I was embarrassed. And this, this, this is shameful to admit, but I will admit it. I zipped up my jacket, right, as much as I could, so I could like. I, I, the hood I tucked into my <laughs> into my jacket. I took the hat and I put it in my jacket. <laughs> zipped. This is terrible. This is not a good Vikings fan. It's not. I admit it. But I zipped it all the way up. I had to cover my purple T-shirt. Right. Just all of it, and made the sad trip home and thoroughly, thoroughly got made fun of at work. Unfortunately, tragedy for the team did not end on the field at Giant Stadium. But rather, things only got sadder at training camp in 2001. I can still smell the grass that day. I know it was hot, and it was one of the hottest training camps I've been involved in. Big K was right next to me, and we're walking off. We've got our shoulder pads in our hands, and all of a sudden, he just drops. And he drops to the ground, and I can remember my last words were, Big K, you all right? You all right? And he says, I'm all right. I'm all right. On August 1st, 2001, while at training camp, offensive lineman Corey Stringer, who was returning from a Pro Bowl season in 2000, collapsed on the field. Stringer's death from heat stroke brought about many changes in the league as they moved to better protect their players. Um, pass rushing drills one day, and um, Coach Brown was like, you can't let this big man block you, he's 360 pounds. So during the drill, Big K word, you no, know, yet I was saying, I'm 336, man. This is the lightest I've ever been in my life, man. Give me some respect. <laughs> <laughs> and while you're here, just have a good time, because he loves everybody. Ultimately, the Vikings season faltered, missing the playoffs for the first time since 1995, as they played without Robert Smith, who denounced his retirement at the end of last season. They finished at 5-11, a disappointment that led Dennis Green to be fired and replaced by Mike Tice. Future Hall of Fame wide receiver Chris Carter also bid his farewell to the team, announcing his retirement before briefly returning to the league to play a half season for the Dolphins. 2002 opened with some appropriately lowered expectations as the team worked under new head coach Mike Tice. A young running back in Michael Bennett and receiving core now without a key veteran. The team fell to the Bills in overtime as part of a four-game losing streak they endured to start the season. I agree. Vic looks to escape on third and seven, and it's Vic Rogers. 
The Vikings would take the Falcons to overtime in Week 13, reminding some of the 1998 NFC Championship game that seemed all too recent in the memories of fans. This will be a 29-yard attempt as the Vikings look to tie the score with 14 seconds remaining. And it's in straight through. We are tied at 24. Just now, a trip to the Super Bowl was not on the line. In fact, currently standing at 3-9, and nine, virtually nothing but pride was on the line for the Vikings. The rough season that was 2002 could nearly be summed up in one play in overtime in the Metrodome. Michael Vick put the Vikings into a highlight reel when he juked his way to a 46-yard run in overtime for a game-winning touchdown. And while the Vikings would win the final three games of the season, it proved all too late as they finished... 6 and 10. With two new young additions to their defense in Kevin Williams and EJ Henderson, the Vikings picked up where they left off with a winning streak they established at the end of last season and put together six straight wins to open the 2003 season. They also seem to have rebooted their once powerful offense, and under Culpepper, they gained by far the most yards of any team in the league, earning Culpepper a Pro Bowl nomination. On the run, terrific throw to Kelly Campbell by Dante Culpepper. Mike Shanahan said Culpepper with time running out here in the first half. All kinds of time. Going to throw it deep for Moss. Pulls it in at the 10-yard line. Flips it over his head. This is a touchdown. However, the team lost momentum quickly and found themselves on a four-game losing streak, including a close loss to the Packers in the middle of the season. Clock continues to run, PA. 17, 16, 15. See, With a 9 and 6 record and their chance at a playoff appearance on the line in the final game against the Cardinals, this one came down to the final play after the Cardinals had moved within one score after a touchdown with 154 to play. He steps up. He's all by himself. Fires into the end zone. Touch! Touchdown! No! No! The Cardinals have knocked the Vikings out of the playoffs. I believe it was caught by Nate Poole. McCowan's miracle play for the Cardinals officially eliminated the Vikings from playoff contention and left a disappointing taste in the mouth of the entire fan base. And we'll see Culpepper first. Minnesota will receive the opening. 2004, however, began in a mediocre fashion. Michael Bennett still did not look promising for the running game, and an injury to Randy Moss early in the season predictably damaged the passing game. However, Culpepper refused to be stopped, as he went 5-2 through the start of the season, as he put up MVP quality passing numbers. Challenge it, but he won't win the challenge. And now Culpepper will try to take it in himself, and with that big body, there's no sign yet. Did he get across the goal line? He did. However, things would begin to fall apart in Week 9, as the Vikings lost a close game to the Colts. They would skid out of the regular season with an equal number of wins and losses at 8-8. Eight and eight. And the Colts are up by 3. So they had the great luxury of knowing Minnesota had just one timeout, already being in field goal range, milking the clock, and leaving Minnesota with the scantest of chances right now on a kickoff return for a touchdown. But even with a 500 record, the Vikings were able to qualify for a wild card spot and an opportunity to take on the Packers at Lambeau Field. We renew the great rivalry between the Vikings and the Green Bay Packers, meeting for the first time in the playoffs. The Vikings defense ran the table, intercepting Favre four times to make way for Culpepper's four touchdown passes. Culpepper flings it Burleson for the touchdown for the Vikings. The Vikings played well above the level of an 8-8 team and quickly found themselves coming away with a 31-17 win after a celebration by Randy Moss would make the game even more memorable. Culpepper, Moss, Randy Moss is in for a touchdown. Oh, Al Harris playing off. Bit up on the route, and Randy Moss, without even really being able to run, as he shoots the moon to the fans here in Green Bay. That is a disgusting act by Randy Moss, and it's unfortunate that we had that on our air live. That is disgusting by Randy Moss. 
But the next week, the Vikings came out of the gate in Philadelphia as heavy underdogs to the Eagles. The dual threat of Donovan McNabb and running back Brian Westbrook proved too much to match as the Vikings' efforts seemed all too late in the 27-14 loss that sent them home once again. Randy Moss knows that they blew an easy touchdown. He would have had an easy walk-in Welcome back to Raiders Report. The acquisition of Randy Moss in the offseason by the Silver and Black caused shockwaves around football. After a year damaged by a hamstring injury and a career low in receptions and receiving yards, the Vikings announced Moss would be traded to the Oakland Raiders in exchange for linebacker Napoleon Harris, a first and a seventh round pick. The first round pick, a seventh overall selection, was used to draft receiver Troy Williamson, assumably Moss's successor. Under pressure, blitz right away, and Will Witherspoon gets a sack. The season started difficultly at 2 and 5, and proved no better for Culpepper, who was struggling without Moss's deep threat, and the running game did little to help. An injury to Culpepper during a Week 8 game against the Panthers effectively ended his season, causing former Viking Brad Johnson to return his starter for the first time since he was replaced by Cunningham in 1997. The Vikings playoff chances don't need a five minute explanation. In fact, they're quite simple. Win and stay alive. Lose and say goodbye. Johnson put hopes of a playoff run back on the table as he won six straight. By the time they faced the Ravens on Christmas, they stood at eight and six. Trailing by 10 near the end of the game, they bet their final playoff shot on Paul Ettinger's foot, who ultimately could not pull off the impossible. Three. Now the onside kick, That's which is my first favorite part play. of the formula. That's right. This is my favorite part of the game. Here they go. Watch this. Yeah. Recovered by the Ravens at the 40-yard line. The loss not only eliminated the Vikings from playoffs, despite a 9-7 finish, but also caused Mike Tice to lose his job. 2006 ushered in a new era of Vikings football, as well as fresh hope and fresh faces for the future. Eagles offensive coordinator Brad Childress signed as head coach and immediately made moves that would change the future of the franchise. It started with drafting linebacker Chad Greenway out of Iowa and cornerback Cedric Griffin. But Childress didn't stop there. He also drafted quarterback Travaris Jackson to fill the hole left by Culpepper. Furry in motion. Oh, wow, what a play. Ball's out. Nice ball. Touchdown Vikings. Dave Lieber. Pat Williams forced the fumble. Lieber recovers. So I don't want to talk bad about Brad Childress. I mean, the guy looks like a, he looks like a cartoon dad, you know? Like if you, if you watch it, like a kid's cartoon and one of the kids has a, has kind of a stern dad who's kind of inept like he, and he kind of talks like this you know you shouldn't do that dur, dur, dur. that's what Brad Childress like he kind of embodies that for me and Harry Potter and all his wizard friends went straight to hell for practicing witchcraft Yay! but the season failed to amount to much in the long run Childress could not get the team to the playoffs as they became the most penalized team in the league and finished the season 6-10 and ten with Brad Johnson as the starting quarterback the kicker Rainer and Johnson takes it in, but keep in mind, there is a flag back at the 13-yard line. During the return, illegal block in the back. The generally uneventful 2006 season led to the team having the 7th overall pick in the 2007 draft. Since Robert Smith's retirement, the Vikings had utilized an incredibly weak running game and looked to beef it up in the draft. They used the 7th overall pick to draft running back Adrian Peterson from Oklahoma in hopes his aggressive run style would carry over well to the pro level. Wide receiver Sidney Rice was also drafted as a viable receiving option in the deep threat after Troy Williamson had failed to deliver. Peterson's presence was noticed immediately as he took the field during his rookie season to support quarterback Travars Jackson. In week 6, despite a 1-3 start, the Vikings shocked everyone. With Jackson throwing just 9 of 23 completions, Peterson picked up the slack big by delivering over 200 yards and 3 touchdowns. Devin Hester goes in for the touchdown! But with the game tied at 31 with less than 2 minutes left, it was Peterson's kick return that made Longwell's game-winning big kick possible. And here's the kick. 
In week 9, Peterson put up one of the biggest games for a running back in NFL history. With 296 yards and 3 touchdowns, he lifted the Vikings to a win over the Chargers. To the 10, touchdown. Adrian's rookie year, that 297 game against the Chargers, he was unstoppable, determined. He broke that defense. They quit chasing. To the 30, still on his feet, 35, and down at the 37-yard line. If it wasn't for that horse collar. 30, down the sideline and just pulled from behind. And the penalty marker is down. Well, that might be a horse collar tackle. How about the performance by number 28 of the Minnesota Vikings? Our final score. In week 10, however, the Vikings suffered one of their most embarrassing defeats, losing in a 34-point shutout to the Packers. To only make it worse, Peterson left the game with an injury. To the 26 and shaken up. Gain of 11. And this is... This is tough. He has avoided injury this year after having injury problems at Oklahoma. And that was always a question. But the Vikings came away from the Packers game at 3-6 and six and seemingly without anything to play for. Or at least that's the way it seemed until the team pulled off a five-game win streak to advance to 8-6. and six. But in Week 16, a loss to the Redskins ended that streak and thus eliminated them from playoff contention. Peterson ran for less than 30 yards and the game helped to show that when Peterson was off, the whole team was off. 2008 began with new hope for what the offense could bring through the power of Adrian Peterson's running ability, but the defense was also not to be forgotten. The Vikings traded their first round, two third round, and a sixth round selection to the Chiefs in exchange for Jared Allen, a rising defensive end. And Rodgers sneaking in for the touchdown. He got those bodies out of there. Got a Lambo. The Vikings opened their season on Monday Night Football, facing off against the Farvelous Packers. The Vikings struggled all game, particularly in the passing game, and relied heavily on Peterson to move the ball. On the opposite side, Rodgers opened the season throwing 18 of 22 completions and leaving Vikings fans to wonder how it was the Packers had stumbled upon two straight quality quarterbacks. The Vikings once again found themselves opening a season at 1-3 and, and far from the spot they wanted to be in when they faced the Saints on the road in Week 5. Veteran journeyman Gus Farratt was given the start in a game that came down to the wire. In the last couple of minutes against Denver, this kick is blocked and in the air, on flight, Antoine Winfield will put the Vikings right to even. Touchdown! That's a stunner. When the Saints failed to convert on a 46-yard field goal just before the two-minute warning, the game remained tied heading into the final minutes. With just over two minutes left, Farratt launched a pass deep to Bernard Berrien that landed incomplete but drew a penalty flag. The 42-yard pass interference penalty put the Vikings in position for Longwell's game-winning kick that was sealed by rookie Tyrell Johnson's interception of Breeze on the Saints' final play. Looks like the Vikings did a better job of sure leaping did. for the football than the Saints did. You got to have one guy leap and the rest of those receivers just hang around for the tip. No one left. A few weeks later, the Vikings took the field in the Metrodome to square off against the Packers. The division rivalry featured both teams entering at 4-4. Four and four. The game proved to be one of the most pivotal of the season. Defense trumped all as the Vikings tossed Rodgers to the ground four times and the Packers intercepted Farratt three times. But the entire NFL still failed to answer to Adrian Peterson, who put up over 200 all-purpose yards in the day. Stiff arms, Big B for the touchdown. And he did do it himself. With less than two minutes remaining in the game, Rodgers led the pack downfield, but the Vikings defense made the stop at the 34-yard line, leading to a game-breaking field goal by Mason Crosby. Good snap, good hold, the kick. No good. The Vikings held on to the momentum from the win and carried it to a 10-6 finish and a wild card spot. But above all, they won the NFC North. 
They were given home field advantage for their game against the Eagles in the playoffs. Just as they had in the 2004 Divisional Series, McNabb and Westbrook came out swinging. With the Vikings forced to start Travaris Jackson, they tried to lean more heavily on Peterson, but the Eagles defense smelted out and held them to less than 100 yards. But it was the Westbrook 71-yard touchdown catch in the fourth quarter that truly shut the door on the Vikings season, just as they had in the past. Coming off a playoff appearance and featuring arguably the league's best running back, fans were ready to see how the team was going to finally acquire the quarterback that would lead them to the Super Bowl. With Farratt entering retirement, the Vikings signed Texans quarterback Sage Rosenfels to compete with Travars Jackson. With the 22nd pick in the 2009 NFL Draft, the Minnesota Vikings select Percy Harvin, wide receiver, Florida. To help the cause, the team drafted Percy Harvin at wide receiver and Phil Lodholt at offensive tackle with their first two picks. Everything changed in August. Even the very meaning of what it meant to be a Vikings fan changed. For it was known that a true Viking could never trust the Packers, and no single person had more embodied the Packers organization over the last two decades than Brett Favre. He'd been a fierce competitor his entire career, and after spending a lackluster year in New York, after his decision to come out of retirement to play for the Jets in 2008, Favre believed his career was over. But that proved to not be the case, as Favre shocked the world when he signed with none other than his former rival, the Vikings. This kicked off one of the greatest media frenzies in recent Vikings history. When Brad called yesterday, I was actually on my way up to high school, I was kind of helping out with the kids, and, and we had a good conversation. I hadn't talked to him in three weeks. Um, he said, I, you know, just give it another shot, see if you want to take that change. The addition of a future Hall of Fame quarterback heavily raised the Vikings' expectations for 2009. But some questioned if Favre still had the touch. The Vikings opened the season against the Browns on the road, and expectations were high for Favre to deliver the team a win. Four receivers set, Favre, caught, Harvin, extends, touchdown! The first touchdown in the career of Percy Harvin, and he will never forget it because it's thrown by the Hall of Famer, the future Hall of Famer. While Favre still adjusted to the offense, Peterson stole the show, putting up nearly 200 all-purpose yards and showing his dominant running strength as the Vikings won 34-20. to shoves away one, shoves away another, and blasts his way into the end zone. A spectacular run by the most spectacular runner in the NFL, Adrian. At 2-0, the Vikings played their first game back in the Metrodome during Week 3 against the 49ers. Minnesota welcomed Favre as the game unfolded into an NFL Classic. Trailing 20-24 with 1.29 to play on the clock, Favre orchestrated an amazing drive to put the team in position for one last play. Favre rolls, lets the throw deep and does to the end zone for The Metrodome shook as the Vikings fans felt this year may finally be their year. This year may finally be the real deal. In week four, Favre was set to face off against his former team on Monday Night Football. There, he connected with multiple receiving options in the end zone, throwing three touchdowns. But the real story was Jared Allen, who pulled Rodgers down in the end zone for a safety as one of eight Viking sacks on Rodgers. The Packers tried to assemble a late game comeback, but the Vikings stood tall once again. The win made Favre the first quarterback to ever defeat all 32 NFL teams. After having lost just one of their first 11 games, losing only to the Steelers, the Vikings were on a hot streak before pairing up with the Cardinals, who were coming off a Super Bowl appearance. The Vikings came into the game looking to air things out after the running game failed to develop. Instead, Favre was intercepted twice en route to a 30-17 loss. Favre swings it over the middle, picked off at the 40-yard line. This is Michael Adams, and he takes the ball to the 44-yard line of Minnesota. 
The Vikings struggled for the remainder of the season before closing things out by embarrassing the Giants 44-7, just as the Giants had once done to them so many years ago in the conference championship. This matched them up against Tony Romo and the Cowboys in the divisional round. The game opened slowly, but quickly developed into a chance for the Vikings to not only advance to the conference championship, but also flex their muscles. Sidney Rice caught three of Favre's four touchdown passes as the Vikings refused to slow down. Even with a 17-3 lead at the start of the fourth quarter, the Vikings poured on another 17 points in a stellar fourth quarter performance. The defense was once again nothing to be overlooked, as the Vikings sacked Romo six times and put his passer rating down to 66.1. Coming up later on fourth down, play action, Favre, end zone, Shanko, how about another? Touchdown Vikings. You don't think the Vikings were trying to make a statement with that one, do you? Well, I was going to say, they just rubbed the Cowboys' nose in it here with a minute 55 remaining. Red Favre has his fourth touchdown pass. The Vikings had advanced to play in the NFC Conference Championship game for the first time since they were routed by the Giants in 2000. Now they would face off against the Saints in New Orleans and provided the best chance the Vikings had had in years to reach the Super Bowl. The game would go down at the time as one of the greatest in NFL history. On one side was Breeze trying to take New Orleans to the Super Bowl and give a community still recovering from Hurricane Katrina hope. On the other side was Favre, a career-long Vikings rival, now trying to take the team that he once most opposed to the Peterson Super Bowl. Again. How about Adrian Peterson and the Vikings with an opening drive touchdown? The game went into the locker room tied at 14 apiece after mishaps by both teams. And after back-to-back -back quick scores, the third quarter would also end with the game tied at 21. But the cracks were beginning to show. A 40-year-old quarterback and a running back who'd never played in such a big game in the NFL before were beginning to wear down. All game, Favre had been attacked by the Saints' defense, arguably at times even well after the pass was thrown. As the bruises began to take hold, it would make the fourth quarter be more difficult than it seemed. Standing near their own end zone, Childress called back-to-back -back wide receiver run plays as Favre handed off to Percy Harvin. This proved costly as Harvin fumbled the ball, quickly resulting in a Saints touchdown and a loss of the lead. Quick set up and throw, pass is caught, ball is out. Another fumble. On the next possession, after driving to the Saints red zone, Bernard Berrien coughed up a fumble on a hit by Tracy Porter. But the Vikings defense quickly placed the Saints in a three and out. Starting near midfield and being aided by pass interference penalty on Porter, Peterson scored the game-tying touchdown with just five minutes to play. Adrian Peterson has his third of the day. A two-yard run. And with the extra point coming, we're on our way to 28-28. Breeze and the Saints got the ball back with five minutes to try and beat the Vikings defense. But Ray Edwards broke through for a sack on Breeze, causing a fumble that the Saints would recover. However, the loss of yardage set the Vikings defense up for another forced three and out and giving Favre one last chance to lead a drive for the history books. And to the history books, it would go. And makes the catch and now has to fight, has a first down. A key third down conversion to Berrien, a deep ball to Sidney Rice, and a big run by Chester Taylor set the Vikings up at the Saints 33 and quite believably in range for Longwell's field goal. Childress called run plays on the first and second down to chew the clock down to 19 seconds while remaining at the 33 yard line. But miscommunication came at the time where it was least afforded. Favre recognized that the Vikings had 12 players in the field and attempted to call a timeout, but the penalty was noticed by the refs, backing them up to the 38. Third down and 15. Favre sprints to his right, throws back across the middle. And he's intercepted, Porter. The return by Porter, and he's brought down with seven seconds left. And the rest would be history. After the Saints chose to receive the kickoff, Favre and the offense never touched the ball again, as they were forced to watch Garrett Hartley make a 40-yard field goal and send the Vikings back to Minnesota.
With a great showing last season, the Vikings hoped to turn their 50th season in the NFL into a year to remember. But something had changed about the Vikings, particularly about their leader. Favre never truly recovered from the injuries he sustained against the Saints. After an ongoing investigation, the NFL announced in 2012 that the Saints had a bounty system in place to target and injure players, particularly Favre. The rising young receiver Sidney Rice, who had proved to be a deep threat for Favre, also started the season on the physically unable to perform list after an injury he suffered against the Saints. We want him running sideways. We want his head sideways. To make matters worse, the Vikings were forced to open the season in New Orleans for a rematch with the Saints. The game proved to be a low-scoring affair with multiple missed field goals, but the Vikings came up short in a 9-14 loss. Touchdown. And Brett Favre who came into the building tonight and he was laughing about it before the game. He said, I'm on the bus and I'm thinking, what am I doing here? He's happy he's here right now. Touchdown, Minnesota. Thomas behind Evans, a yard away from taking the lead. And Thomas is able to lunge into the end zone for a Saints touchdown. After a 1-2 and two start, the Vikings made a move in the bye week that got the fan base talking again. After a trade with the New England Patriots, Randy Moss was brought back to Minnesota. Far jump ball. Moss would instantly become a prime target for Favre as he caught four passes for 81 yards in the Vikings' Week 5 matchup against the Jets on Monday Night Football. Favre tossed his historic 500th touchdown pass in that night to none other than Randy Moss, an idea that once seemed so unthinkable. Favre looking that way, throwing to the corner for Harvin, two feet down, yes! Touchdown Vikings! But the Vikings still trailed 20-22 when Favre tried to lead a final drive to give the team the lead, and ultimately threw a pick six that put any chance at a victory out of reach. Game winner. After a poor 3-7 and seven start for Childress, the team decided to fire the coach and replace him with interim coach Leslie Frazier. In the first game under Coach Frazier, the Vikings managed to pull off a 17-13 win against the Redskins behind a great game by rookie running back Toby Gerhardt. Boy, Peterson wants to get back in. Third down and one. Hand off Gerhardt. First down. Gerhardt driving to the goal line. Touchdown! Toby Gerhardt, the second round pick from Stanford, goes over to give the Vikings their first lead of the game. Play action, you're right, here goes Favre, he's going to carry, he'll get the first down inside the 15, and that should seal it up for the Vikings. In week 13, Favre was injured on a hit against the Bills in the Metrodome, ultimately causing him to miss extended playing time and end his streak of 297 consecutive starts. Another pick, the 18th for Brett Favre, who is down and in pain. Boy, was he drilled from behind. At 5-7, and seven, the Vikings appeared to be on the verge of collapsing without Favre in the mix. But it wasn't only the team's playoffs hopes that were collapsing, it was the roof of their stadium. This resulted in the Vikings being forced to play that week on Monday night instead of Sunday against the Giants in Detroit after the Metrodome repair was going to take some time. Tonight the roof came down on the Metrodome. I had tickets and it's about a five hour drive to get to Minneapolis. And I was checking the weather reports the whole evening because it looked like there was going to be a ton of snow. And about 11 o'clock, I, I heard a report that the roof was coming down. So I had to phone a uh, guy I was going with. That's downtown Philadelphia on this 28th night of December. A beautiful sight. But 48 hours ago, a major snowstorm roared up the eastern seaboard of Philadelphia, one of the cities in the crosshairs. And so on the night after Christmas, there would be no game at Lincoln Financial Field, with the NFL postponing the contest because of public safety concerns. Thus, Sunday night football has become football on a Tuesday night. The snow wouldn't stop affecting the Vikings' season as they took to the road in Philadelphia and were once again met by delays. With Favre re-injured and out for the remainder of the season, 
the Vikings started rookie quarterback Joe Webb in a matchup that featured two of the fastest quarterbacks in the game. Antonio Winfield's fumble recovery touchdown, as well as Joe Webb's ability to manage the game with Peterson, helped the Vikings to a 24-14 win. Webb would close out the season with a close loss against the Lions and ended the season at 6-10. Touchdown, Minnesota. With the end of the season, Favre bid his true retirement from the NFL. Like NFL. Thank the Vikings, uh, my teammates, uh, fans. It's been, a, it's been a wonderful experience for me. This year did not work out the way um, we would have hoped, but that's football. And um, I don't regret coming back. Uh, I enjoyed my experience here. To begin 2011, Leslie Frazier took over as head coach officially and immediately worked to fill holes left by Favre's departure by drafting a quarterback. Another big time low moment. Christian Ponder of Florida State becomes the fourth quarterback taken in the first 12 picks. Leslie Frazier said if that guy was out there, that would be someone you could build around, like Jay Cutler, like Aaron Rodgers, like Matthew Stafford, and the rest of that division. He said he wanted that guy. He believes it's Christian Ponder. But instead of Ponder, it was McNabb, who was signed from the Redskins, that started at quarterback. Assisting him would be tight end Kyle Rudolph, who was also drafted alongside Ponder. But the team had a rough start, losing their first four games. This included a close loss to the Lions in overtime after the Lions scored all their points in the second half. And Hansen's kick is good and the Lions have ended another streak. They end a 13 game losing streak here in Minnesota in a tremendous comeback. After a terrible 1-5 start by McNabb, he was replaced by Ponder in week 7. Recovered by Jared Allen. With little more than Adrian Peterson to help him, the rookie quarterback was largely thrown to the Wolves. But with the game tied at 21 with 10 minutes left, Ponder orchestrated a 7 minute drive to bring Longwell into field goal range. This gave the Vikings a lead that was solidified by the Panthers missed game tying field goal. The Ponder era had officially started in Minnesota, but it had been quite a disappointing start as Ponder had lost the next seven games, including one against the Saints in Week 15. The team would end the season at 3-13, but Jared Allen and the rest of the defensive line still finished with a great season. Allen broke the Vikings franchise records for sacks with 22 on the season, while in total the defense claimed 50, the most in the NFL. He steps up, Jared Allen got him, and there it is! Jared Allen has done it! 22 sacks! Greats, Jim Marshall and Carl Eller, Jared Allen is Vikings immortality. Jared Allen, 22 sacks in an otherwise unforgettable 2011 season where the Vikings had three wins. It was virtually unwatchable at points. But because of Jared, I watched every snap of that season. Multiple big draft picks were selected by the Vikings in 2012 including offensive lineman Matt Khalil, kicker Blair Walsh, and wide receiver Jarius Wright, and most notably of all, safety Harrison Smith. That's a pick I really like. They haven't had a safety in Minnesota since, what's his name, left for New Orleans? Sharper. Darren Sharper. Darren Sharper, thank you. He will step in right now. I think he's the best pure zone free safety in the draft. He's got a better skill set than people think. He's more athletic. The Vikings opened against the Jaguars at home and quickly energized the fan base with a game that set the tone for the Vikings season. With Ponder working primarily through the short passing game, Peterson once again proved to be the glue of the offense, scoring twice on the ground. For 
the end zone, his second touchdown today. But it was Walsh, the rookie kicker that made his name known in Minnesota during the game. Walsh netted two fourth quarter field goals before Jaguars quarterback Blaine Gabbert connected with... Caught by Shorts! It is a touchdown! A 39-yard touchdown pass. With 20 seconds left in the game, the Vikings trailed by three points. After a 22-yard kickoff return by Matt Asiata and two clutch throws by Ponder, the Vikings were on the edge of field goal range with four seconds left. With the ball at the 37 in his first career NFL game, Walsh connected from 55 yards, leading to the most improbable overtime period. Claire Walsh. In overtime, Walsh would hit again, this time from 38 yards, in what would go on to be the game-winning field goal. After a 5-2 start, things were looking up for the Vikings, but they needed to stay on track if they wanted to make the playoffs for the first time since 2009. In Week 8, however, the team struggled against the Bucks, who themselves were not having all that great of a season. Pump fake, and now the throw is intercepted, and that's just going to cap things off for a tough night for Christian Potter. The Vikings fell 36 to 17. Ponder on the take, giving Adrian Peterson drill home, breaks a tackle. Running right, Conti trying to get an angle, does it. To the sidelines, the midfield. And he brings him down to the 28 yard line of the Bears. Hey, whatever he's on, I want some, man. In week 14, the Vikings got back on track and made their playoff run serious as the division tightened up. The Bears would visit Minnesota in a game that would see Peterson turn out two touchdowns in the first quarter. But with Ponder's throwing attempts being severely limited by the play calling, the Bears refused to go down quietly. Harrison Smith, however, made a big play in the third quarter, intercepting Cutler and returning 56 yards to the end zone, ultimately creating a lead that the Bears could not dig themselves out of. Yeah, that was Kevin Williams coming in late, just destroying everything that came in. After beating the Rams and Texans, the Vikings faced the Packers at home in the season finale. A win would put the team in the wild card round. The game also proved significant as Peterson stood on the threshold of Dickerson's NFL rushing record. Here comes Adrian Peterson. He is 208 yards shy of a single season record. That record that he's been chasing and many other backs since 1984, the 2105 put up by Eric Dickerson, then of the LA Rams. The Vikings went into halftime with a 20 to 10 lead, but the high-scoring shootout didn't slow down after half. Ponder found Michael Jenkins for a touchdown in the fourth quarter, but Rodgers answered back, hitting Jordy Nelson for a game-tying score with just under three minutes left. Peterson led the drive to try to tie the game, including making a pivotal run of 26 yards to put the Vikings into field goal range with just three seconds to play. Most importantly, this play put Peterson over 2,000 yards in the season and just nine yards short of the NFL rushing record. Walsh hit the game-winning field goal as time expired and the Vikings prepared to rematch the Packers in the wild card round. Peterson's performance throughout the season earned him the respect of the NFL and MVP honors. This is amazing, you know, um, just to join an elite group of legends has been before me and motivated me to, to grab this and get this and continue to get this. Um, you know, I was just, just, you know, just so inspiring, man. It, it, it feels good. With Ponder out for the playoff game, the Vikings traveled to Lambeau in hopes that Peterson could once again lead the team to victory. Instead, the Vikings fell behind in the first quarter, and Webb was unable to regain ground until it was far too late. Once again, the Vikings came up short in the playoffs. This time is Jenkins, and Jenkins will take it to the end zone. And the pass will be caught, and that's Rudolph, and he'll take it to the 15, and the Green Bay Packers have won this wild card playoff game and head to Candlestick Park to meet the 49ers next Saturday night. 2013 was set to be the Vikings' last season in the Metrodome before renovations on the new stadium would begin. The team was determined to go out with a bang and began by drafting a variety of future stars including Sheriff Floyd, Xavier Rhodes, Cordell Patterson, and punter Jeff Locke. Because the quarterback position was one they had so long struggled with, they also acquired longtime backup quarterback Matt Castle. The Vikings struggled early in the season, losing the first three games despite close scores. 
Not even the 105-yard kickoff return by rookie Cordell Patterson on the opening kickoff against the Bears was enough to boost the team. Another 5 of 6 on the drive. And down he goes and the football is loose and Robinson has it. And Robinson inside the 20, the 10, and that is a touchdown for Minnesota. While the game remained close the entire time, with just 10 seconds left in the game while leading by 6 points, Jake Cutler tossed the game-winning touchdown pass for the Bears to come out on top 31-30. to Looking to redeem themselves from their poor start, the Vikings traveled all the way to London for a game against the Steelers, who were also without a win. The game quickly transpired into a Vikings highlight reel as Walsh opened by kicking a 54-yard field goal. On top of this, Castle threw a 70-yard touchdown pass to former Packers receiver Greg Jennings. Then, Peterson pulled off a 60-yard run in the second quarter that he extended all the way to the end zone. While leading 34-17 at the start of the fourth quarter, the Steelers tried to come back, scoring 10 points in the last period, but the Vikings held on for their first win. 19 seconds. Which team is going to save the season? With the umbrella defense. Got to keep it in front of us what they're doing. Roethlisberger cannot afford a sack right now. And the ball comes out. And the Vikings have made the play to seal the victory. Well, folks, the Minnesota Vikings made a bold move today. They signed free agent quarterback Josh The Freeman. shocking decision to sign Freeman would bring a lot of buzz and a lot of controversy to the team, which currently sat at 1-4 and, and was in need of a special jump start. But on Monday Night Football against the Giants, that jump start seemed to only come from electrifying Marcus Sherrills. From his 14, a return from Marcus Sherrills. A flag is down as okay. Sherrills comes at the punter Weatherford, picking up his block, and Sherrills taking it all the way back for the touchdown. But under Freeman, the offense evaporated. On 53 passing attempts, he completed just 20. Peterson was defended against heavily as the passing game failed in the Vikings and they were unable to put together many long drives and ultimately suffered an embarrassing 7-23 loss. The costly Freeman experiment was quickly abandoned and Ponder was back in the lineup against the Packers the next week. Despite another huge kickoff return by Patterson, the Vikings defense was dismantled at the hands of Rodgers who threw 24 completions on 29 attempts. With the Vikings defense unable to force a turnover, the team fell 31 to 44. And through the middle, there goes Starks, and Starks all the way to the end zone. A month later, the Vikings defense got a chance to redeem themselves against the Packers. Heading into Lambeau at 2 8 meant the Vikings had little to play for, but a victory over their greatest rival could provide a huge boost of morale. The Vikings dominated the majority of the game and began the fourth quarter leading 23-7. But the defense choked hard and the Packers put up 16 unanswered points to force the game to overtime. The defense, however, made a huge stop, keeping the Packers out of the end zone after having had a first and goal. But a successful field goal followed and thus forced the Vikings to match or exceed the three points scored on the following possession. Toby Gerhardt had multiple runs of 10 or more yards as the Vikings drove down into field goal range. Walsh managed to hit a 35-yarder and put the game into sudden death. But in the unlikeliest series of events, the clock ran all the way down and the two teams left with a tie. While the Vikings were far from playoff contenders, the next week proved just as exciting as this Week 13 matchup with the Bears also rolled into overtime after a 20-20 tie in regulation. Here into this attempt for a 66-yarder just a little bit short, clearly what would have been between the uprights, so there's no question it's within him. After Robbie Gold failed to give the Bears the game-winning field goal they needed, Peterson turned it around and positioned Walsh for the game winner. And now Walsh from 34 yards away, and it is good Minnesota! The Vikings still traded wins and losses for the remainder of the season and ended at 5-10-1 and one and outside of playoff range. In an attempt to improve over last season's poor performance, 
the Vikings replaced Frazier with Mike Zimmer at head coach. To sweeten the deal, the Vikings made draft choices they believed would change the future of the franchise. With the 32nd pick in the 2014 NFL Draft, the Minnesota Vikings select Teddy Bridgewater, quarterback, Louisville. Still in search of a quarterback, the Vikings drafted Teddy Bridgewater from Louisville. To build the leadership of the defense, the Vikings also drafted Anthony Barr, a middle linebacker from UCLA, earlier in the draft. Castle would hold the starting position heading into Week 1 against the Rams. The season started off hot for the Vikings as they proved all-out dominant. Cordell Patterson continued to be a versatile big play receiver who also worked well on the ground. The Vikings dominated the Rams 34-6 in a game that seemed to signal that all the pieces were finally coming together for Minnesota. What a move he makes and he will score! He's in there, down in four, this is two down territory by the way, and this pass is intercepted, picked off by Harrison Smith. Harrison Smith has a blocker in front of him, a lineman, and Harrison Smith is going to score. Everson Griffin was downfield to block for Smith, and he goes to and scores. Minnesota Vikings running back Adrian Peterson was thrown for a big loss today. The NFL suspended him without pay for the rest of this season and possibly longer after Peterson pleaded no contest to physically abusing his four-year-old son. Then came the news nobody ever wanted to hear. It was an ugly situation, but one the franchise would have to work through for the season. They had to acquire Jarek McKinnon, an extremely fast running back with a lot of potential in the third round of the draft, and would turn to him and a carousel of others to pick up the slack. The issues would only continue when Castle was injured in week three, causing Bridgewater to come into the starting role in his rookie season. The team, however, had a record of 3-5 when they faced the Redskins at home in Week 9, and were not out of playoffs quite yet. Bridgewater completed a respectable 26 of his 42 passing attempts, and played with confidence as he led a drive to try to take the lead in the fourth quarter. Matt Ellison with a first down on each side. Ellison on the other side. Matt Asiata, and yeah! He's got another Viking touchdown! But one of the Vikings' most exciting games of the season would come a month later when the Jets came it down. The Vikings assumedly had the upper hand against the two-win Jets, but the matchup proved tougher than expected. But in the waning seconds of the game, Jets kicker Nick Folk hit a 44-yard field goal to tie it at 24. Walsh missed a field goal at the end of regulation, causing the game to go to overtime. After the Jets drive stalled near midfield, the Vikings took over in the shadow of their own end zone, but the big play explosiveness of the offense showed through. The season came to a close at 7 and 9 and without a playoff appearance. However, with a young and improving team, the writing was on the wall for a playoff run next year. With the 45th pick in the 2015 NFL draft, the Minnesota Vikings select Eric Kendricks, linebacker, UCLA. Zimmer didn't back down in his goals of assembling a powerful defense and drafted Trey Waynes, Eric Kendricks, and Daniil Hunter in the 2015 draft. The, the Bills just announced that they're acquiring Matt Castle mm -hmm. uh, from uh, the Vikings. That'll be completed. Moves were made at the quarterback position as well, as Castle was traded to the Bills and Ponder was released, handing the starting job to Bridgewater. After opening the season with a 2-1 start, Bridgewater led the Vikings into Denver to face the undefeated Broncos. The Vikings offense struggled early as they fell into a 13-0 deficit. How about Teddy B with his team down 10, finding Mike Walls wide open, then the Vikes down 3 at the break. But a quick comeback in the final two minutes of the first half cut this deficit to three points. The Vikings defense fell apart at the time when they were needed most and a game-ending fumble by Bridgewater put to rest any hopes of a comeback. Bridgewater is going to be dropped by T.J. Ward. He loses the ball. The Broncos recover. Zach's drip fumble. And Denver now 4-0 with the 23-20 win. Great job. At 2-2, two two, the team came out of their Week 5 bye looking to turn things up. They did just that, winning two in a row before squaring off with the Bears in Week 8. The Vikings special teams headlined the first half after punt returner Marcus Sherrills returned a punt 65 yards to the end zone. With Sherrills' efforts and two field goals by Walsh, 
The Vikings trailed 20-13 with less than 5 minutes to go in the game. It was then that the young offense came alive. Bridgewater orchestrated a 19-yard run, and rookie wide receiver Stefan Diggs had 60 receiving yards on the final drive as they worked to tie the game. After the Bears' 3 and out, Bridgewater came back once again and led a drive to put the Vikings into field goal range and ultimately win the game. You can trust the guy to make big plays after he gets the ball at yak yardage. Yep. And how about some more yaks there for you, you Willie? Makes one little spin move. On movie. cue. He go. <laughs> On cue. <laughs> uh, he is a nice looking young player. Six catches, 95 yards, and that touchdown tied up at 20 for Stefan that drive instead they had to punt it away back to the Vikings so Teddy Bridgewater under a minute to play going up top Blair Walsh for the win from 36 it is good the Vikings, the Vikings tried to keep the win streak alive in week nine with their matchup against the Rams stadium up there in Minneapolis so here's A.D. saying, all right young fella see what you've been doing but I've been doing it all with whole Peterson lot. rushing for 125 yards in the game the team was in survival mode after Bridgewater was injured on an unnecessary roughness call. The Rams went down the field in the final moments to put Zerlin in range to attempt and make a 53-yard field goal. But with the game in overtime, it would be Walsh who would net the game winner. What is it, Rhett? Good. It's good. Walsh, uh, fired up as his Vikings move to I six. I love it when kickers get all fired up when they make... Still looking good 8-3, the Vikings faced off at home with the Seahawks. Here they would see their most disappointing loss of the season at the hands of Russell Wilson and Thomas Rawls. The 38-7 loss, with the only touchdown coming from Cordero Patterson's kickoff return touchdown, exposed some of Minnesota's biggest issues. Russell right. Wilson throwing the ball, running the ball, getting the running game with Rawls and company. This is uh, this is the best the Seahawks have looked in quite some time. They've been playing well of yeah. late, but this is the best I've played. After the loss, the team needed to quickly turn things around against the Cardinals. The attempt to grab a win in Arizona fell short, however, when the Cardinals made a game-winning field goal with just over a minute remaining and dropped the Vikings to an 8-5 record. The critics continued to doubt the Vikings were a playoff team worthy of making a deep run. Push it. Let's go score. 13 seconds left. Teddy Bridgewater. Oh, no. Sacked by Dwight Free. He fumbles Calais. Campbell recovers. Game, Ooh. set, match. They were in field goal range. Yeah, 48 yeah. yard field goal. So it's not just a given that he, the field goal range, the field goal kick was going to make. But the comeback came in the final weeks of the season as the Vikings won two in a row to advance to 10 and 5 before facing off against their divisional rivals with the same record, the Packers. Despite Bridgewater throwing for less than 100 yards, the Vikings defense delivered a touchdown as well as intercepting Rodgers and holding the Packers to just three points throughout the first three quarters. Ending it is, for the moment you've got Captain Munnerlyn going all the way to the end zone. Packers attempt to come back in the fourth quarter, but they fell short when the Vikings returned home with their tickets to the playoffs. Intercepted in the end zone by Xavier Rose. Entering the wild card week, the Vikings prepared to match up against their most difficult opponents of the season once again. After having suffered such a tragic loss to the Seahawks previously, the defense came into the game looking to shut Russell Wilson down. Hauschka on the sideline, B. Carroll going for it on 4th and 13, so he's not putting his kicker out there. Oh, that was the running back punt. After Wilson threw a touchdown pass to Doug Baldwin to shrink the Vikings' lead to two points, the most unfortunate event happened to the team. Come the Vikings here after the touchdown and oh, oh, ball out. Oh, Cam Chancellor, as I, he has done so many times. And I love me some Bam Bam Cam, but this one is it. all on AD. Peterson's fumble ultimately translated into a field goal. Now trailing by a single point, the Vikings took over with just under two minutes to go in the game. Bridgewater would struggle in the closure of his first playoff game, but would be aided by a pass interference penalty and a big play by Kyle Rudolph. Now inside the red zone, the Vikings look to wind the clock down through a series of runs. With the ball at the 9-yard line and just 26 seconds on the game clock, the Vikings sent out Walsh for a field goal to win the game. But like so many times before in Vikings playoff history, it became a moment that would live in fans' memories for all the wrong reasons. You know, I, I watched that game, and, and, and here's the thing about a Vikings fan. This is what I'm going to tell you about a Vikings fan. Now, Blair Walsh misses that field goal, right? And because I'm a Vikings fan, instead of, you know, screw the Vikings, you know, I was going to get back into it, but screw it. No, I got excited, and I was like, you know what? No, no, 
I'm in. I'm in. We missed it this year. We're going to do it next year. And for, you know, the 2016 season, I was all in. Today, the Vikings quarterback, Teddy Bridgewater, has apparently gone down with what some are speculating it could be a serious injury. It was a non-contact injury at the Vikings practice today. Hope already seemed lost at the start of the 2016 season after the injury to the promising young quarterback worried the franchise. But with a rising defense and so many other pieces seemingly in place, the coaching staff refused to give up hopes for the year. Then, the Vikings quarterback news made waves again, as they announced the signing of Sam Bradford. But keeping the season together before it even started proved more costly than expected, as they traded away their 2017 first-round pick. Eagle, the Vikings acquired Bradford in a trade with the Eagles on Saturday. Minnesota was in dire need for a quarterback after Teddy Bridgewater went down with a torn ACL in practice last week. While Bradford spent a week on the bench, familiarizing himself with the team and playbook, Backup quarterback Sean Hill stepped into Ada Peterson-driven offense in Week 1 against the Titans. The Vikings struggled early, falling behind 10-0, before Walsh made two redeeming field goals. But it was the powerful Vikings defense that showcased the game. After Kendricks returned an interception all the way to the house, Daniil Hunt replicated the stunt in the fourth quarter to give the Vikings a 22-10 lead, ultimately a 25-16 win. Going all the way in for the touchdown is Daniil Hunter. With Bradford taking over for the first time in Week 2 at home against the Packers, the pressure was immense. So many Vikings quarterbacks acquired on trade had caused widespread disappointment and doubt in the fan base. Bradford delivered, however, throwing for nearly 300 yards and two touchdowns as Peterson was knocked out of the game with an injury. Defense, however, struggled in the secondary as young Trey Waynes was beaten in coverage and flagged multiple times. But at the game's biggest moment, Waynes stepped up and sealed the win. Off by Trey Waynes, the former first round pick seals it. The defending NFC North champs are going to be 2-0. Bradford and the Vikings dominance refused to be slowed by the lack of Peterson or a disappointing offensive line. They won their first five games before heading into bye week, but after that, things started to fall apart. Against the Eagles, Bradford struggled, completing just better than half his passes. The Vikings defense harassed Eagles rookie quarterback Carson Wentz, intercepting him twice. But the Vikings' efforts on offense came too little too late, and they landed their first loss 21-10. To the end zone, and a flag comes in, a touchdown. After a loss the next week to the Bears, the Vikings were at home to face the Lions and trying to save face over their recent struggles. The game would be close. With less than 30 seconds to go, tight end Rhett Ellison was looking like a hero as he gave the Vikings the lead. But just as they'd struggled so many times in the recent weeks, they underwent one of their most difficult moments in the game's fading seconds. The Lions advanced to the Vikings' 40-yard line in just two plays and set Matt Pratter up for a pivotal 58-yard field goal to send the game to overtime. After that, the Vikings' offense would be forced to watch their defense be dismantled and cause the game to end with another loss. Another loss to the Redskins would bring about four consecutive losses for the once 5-0 team. Things changed in Week 11 against the Cardinals when the Vikings were able to hold on to their early lead and preserve a 30-24 win. A score for the Vikings. From the 31, Palmer steps up, airs it out. Floyd downfield, and he's picked again. And again, it's Xavier Rowe. But they would remain struggling behind the lackluster and heavily injured offensive line. They would win just two of their final six games and close the season at 8-8 eight eight with a huge win over the Bears. While meaningless to their playoff hopes, the final game of the season proved one thing. It proved what it meant to be a Viking, and more importantly, a Vikings fan. Those that stuck with the team through all their high points and low points know that you have to pay attention every weekend if you want to be a true fan. Over the last 20 years, some teams have appeared in a handful of Super Bowls. The Vikings, none. They're still searching to enlighten the hopes they had in 1998 and 2009. The teams that came so close to just a mere Super Bowl appearance, let alone the opportunity to hold the Lombardi Trophy. But that does not mean you abandon your team, or you give up on the players that made the franchise who they are. Every fall, there's a renewed hope that maybe, just maybe, this 
will be our year. We will win. Because we will hit all game. We are motivated. We are dedicated. Come on now. Come on now. We will win. Because we are the best on the field. You have your hopes brought up only to have them shot down, right? And, a, and any other kind of fan is going to quit, right? Any other kind of fan is going to quit, but not a Vikings fan, right? Because we've seen it. We've been through it, right? We've been in it. We're like, we're like in the trenches with them. And we're, and, 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 and then, you know, their pain, we feel it, you know? But instead of quitting, like a lot of fans would, we don't. We come back.